So as you might have seen in the, uh, not sure quite when I started this, so people are trying, but as you might have seen in the uh, email and the page we put up, uh, the idea is to give you a little bit of insight about what we've been doing, but mainly to let people ask questions because we're all kind of uh, involved in the development process. So we've been thinking about this for a few weeks. Uh, well, really for uh, over the last year, but especially the last couple of weeks working on this pretty constantly. So um, it's not always totally clear what people already know, what they don't know, what they want to get involved in, what they need to know to get involved. So we wanted to let everyone, after we do a kind of brief presentation of what we've been working on in some you know, timeline, then uh, we'll get into asking questions also, or uh, answering questions also. So just to get started, this is Thomas Glenn and Andrew Bird, Bard. Armstrong. So uh, yeah, we've been working here at uh, into our office in Oslo you know, last uh, week and a half, roughly, mostly on OTP two. So uh, we're gonna as Thomas and Gard have been doing the most work on OTP two. These are full time developers on this, and then uh, of course been helping out too. So. Should we go straight to presenting what we've been working on in the timeline? Sure. Uh, we have a one slide presentation, on, I think. Uh, and we're hoping to do this in a kind of conversational way since we need to hear from everyone else what you are wondering about and everything. So we've got a few slides, but it just serve as kind of a framework for discussion. Um, I want to share my screen, I think. Yeah, maybe this one will be easier. Let's see. So this is uh Johan, is it you can see it? You can't see the shared screen? Strange. Or you have to press um, yeah, yeah, I mean I have no trash on my thing. This is blocking each other. Get down there. So Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, we have been working uh, um, as Andrew said for for the one last week we actually making a lot of stuff that we have done during the uh, past one and a half year. Uh, <clears throat> Was that so long? Thank goodness. I'm just trying to find it. Let's see. Let's go and do it. Yeah, if anyone joins, unfortunately, we'll have to hop over to. So. Yeah. Uh, so we have. Uh, I think we are very close to what's. Uh, what we will call it. Would be to beta release. Uh, I, I'm not sure what uh, you know, what to define a beta, but 
uh, I guess it's uh, what we need to have in a computer to actually start testing it for uh, production uh, here at Imperial, I mean, the production testing, I guess. And uh, to actually switch entirely over to OP2 and uh, um, quit using OP1, uh, all the features that's uh, between OP beta and OP2.0 is, I guess, new. So, yeah. Um, so I guess we could describe what we have just been working on the most and just been adding the most is largely stuff that uh, Intour has already built in the past and has been using. So they have a OTP1 branch that has a lot of these features. And we've been moving them over to OTP2, which has a new routing engine that was also developed mostly uh, here at Intour. So uh, what we've been moving over is a lot of stuff that's related to the European data standards. So they had uh, they had modules to import NetX data, which is sort of the equivalent of GTFS, and modules to use Siri real-time data, which is sort of the equivalent of GTFS RT. So there's we've been cleaning things up. So there's an internal model in OTP for the for the um, public transit data and for the real-time data. And kind of making sure that both the GTFS stuff and the uh, the Siri or European standards both end up inside of OTP in roughly the same format. Uh, so there's a lot of that kind of already existed. It's already been used a few times uh, for for a while. I mean, uh, in OTP one, and it's just moving all that over to OTP two and making sure that it cooperates properly with uh, the new routing engine. So. We, you know, there's a certain amount of work just turning that into pull requests, reviewing it, and getting it in. Since we've all been in the same place, we've been able to review faster, just sit down and go over it together. So at this point, we are pretty much on the verge of taking the OTP2 development branch and running that with the NetX feed and the Siri real-time data. I was hoping to do that today, but just ran into a corrupted zip file, so I didn't get the chance to try everything together, but we're very close to that. So we're kind of right at a point where we expect that we can probably start up an OTP2 server and use all the data from here, right? And so again, the naming is not, the, the definitions are not extremely clear, but uh, the way we're going to use it is what we're calling the 2.0 beta is where we think it's ready for us to try it out and other people to try it out. In, in the case here, we'll be trying it out in production, but just sending some subset of the requests over that direction to OTP2 and, see, and uh, seeing the results that we get from real world requests. And so the, the beta is ready for testing, but it, 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 we may still add features to it. And then uh, at some point in the future, what we'll call the release candidate will be you know, feature freeze. There won't be any more features of it. So yeah, where we're at now is kind of a point where we think we're ready for testing. So helping, hoping that other people uh, might step in and uh, run the system with their data, whether the data is coming from GTFS or uh, NetX, and see how the results look in their cities and their environment, see what is working and what isn't. Um, potentially even dropping it into real world workloads, although the idea right now is to do everything with OTP1, but just send some requests over the two and see how it behaves. Uh, do you want to talk about, I mean, I guess I just described most of what we just did in the last week. Just in case anyone doesn't know, the big picture of OTP2 is replacing the transit routing engine. So there's a street routing and getting you to and from transit stations by various modes. We're leaving that the same for a while, uh, possibly for quite a while, and then replacing the transit playing part, which were, which um, we've had performance problems with for several years on large networks, but we've also had some good prototypes of how to do that um, more efficiently. So that's all been re-implemented, and uh, 
the, the, the router re-implementation was largely finished before. So we've got a good, fast transit router, and now we're piecing that together with the data input. So that's where we are now. And then do you want to describe some of the future things that we expect to do starting now with uh, what's going to be added to the data? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure how all these are, or if they're all of these are interesting, but very short um, support for multi-module stop places or stations and repo stations is it's just a uh, yeah, it's just grouping uh, on a higher level than the station is today. So if you have multi modules or you have a city center that you want to group together, you can search from that and you can uh, move uh, like blocking links from the side of the search uh, or from the internet and the deployment. Um, rated criteria. Uh, this is something that um, we need to test. Uh, it's implemented in the Raptor, but we still have some mapping of the parameters uh, on what we do. We need to map all those rates and uh, factors and make the function mm -hmm. work. Um, <clears throat> Arrive by search. Uh, it's mostly done in the Raptor algorithm. There are some uh, missing uh, uh, pieces here. Uh, it's not a big job. Uh, there is also another what we used to have depart from and arrive by search. Mm -hmm. um, we also have now a third option or actually a kind of timetable where you don't give any priority if you want to leave early or arrive late to just list all the trips that's possible you need more time than that there's some, something i might want to clarify just uh, between there may be people participating who are uh, not involved in the development or don't know all the time so i just want to make sure that some things were clear the new public transit routing system is using the raptor algorithm so anytime we refer to raptor that's the the new transit routing system and we're keeping the old otp1 api that you would see as someone using the trip planning um, system we're keeping that around uh, even if we are adding a new api or experimenting with new apis we're keeping the old api around for the most part with minimal changes so when we're talking about mapping things from the from the api to raptor that's referring to keeping the old API, but getting the parameters, the configuration options that are there to into the new routing system. So only some set of those are being used now, and some of the more detailed options might not make it into the, to the routing yeah. system. Uh, uh, after looking at the existing APIs, there are a couple of APIs uh, floating around now. It's the REST API that's in the main branch of OTP. Uh, then there is also a GraphQL API in uh, the main OTP, which is, I I'm, frankly doesn't know the status on. Mm -hmm. uh, the best version of the GTFS version of the GraphQL API is probably one that HSL in Finland has. Uh, and that is used in Finland and in uh, some other places. Then we have developed a new trans model API, which is also based on GraphQL. Um, uh, the HSL a GraphQL API and the uh, trans model um, a GraphQL API we will analyze, analyze those two uh, to find the uh, uh, a super functionality, I guess, for those two, and then merge the functionality and provide two APIs with one with GTFS terminology and one with transmodal 
they will be very very similar when looking into ways so actually uh, just translating it yeah so the the situation with the apis is that we have the old otp1 api that sort of grew spontaneously over 10 years and now we've got multiple apis there are several new ones and what's what's basically going on is that we have a rest api and a graphql api and then we have two different kinds of data sources which implies there could be four different kinds of apis so you're either using the vocabulary the terms from gtfs or from transmodel which is the vocabulary for netex so basically the gtfs vocabulary or the european standard vocabulary and then there's um there's whether it's a rest api or a graphql api and i guess the at this point for the 2.0 beta we have realized that we're we need to mostly just stick to making sure the 1.0 api continues to work because all the existing clients and even uh, blue software at Entour and everything is using that api so we're going to make sure that one works but all these other apis uh, we couldn't maintain all of them so there'll have to be a focus on uh, on maybe one of them being really good but we still have to yeah. weigh the options and see how how well we can integrate this but the thing that other people can count on is that for this 2.0 beta they should be able to use it roughly like otp1 with some options maybe not having the same effect that they had before yeah and uh, uh one thing that's not on this slide is that we're going to make uh, the trans model uh, version one API that we use at Enter available to a uh, sandbox model. If we want support. If we want support it. It's, we will add it uh, so we can test for test purposes, and we will remove it when uh, we have uh, uh, migrated our environment over to the 2.0 API sometime after the 2.0 release. I guess mm -hmm. maybe if you say something like the sandbox feature. Um, yeah, we can s uh, let me know if anyone wants to have uh, hear about the sandbox feature, and we can talk about that later. Yeah, we can go through this. Uh, I'm also realizing there may be people chatting. We want to make sure we don't miss any messages, so we do not. Sure. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah, there is. Okay, great. Leave that with you. Um, okay. Just want to make sure we didn't have messages there. Yeah. So, yeah, the sandbox. Um, that's been discussed and described in GitHub, but the basic idea is there's a way to add features. If somebody wants to do software development, they can add features quickly with less review if they meet certain criteria and are not are decoupled from the rest of the project so you know, we could add some things but like for example an api that is a combination of vocabulary and api type that is not what we're concentrating on right now if someone wants to add it or we want to add it and try it out we would make it as a sandbox feature that isn't guaranteed to really work well but at least it won't interfere with the rest of the project yeah um the sandbox uh, transform API that we we will add is not going to interfere with the existing code at all. Okay. And so if I were to summarize a lot of the stuff that appears on here from what was being done before, and between the 2.0 beta and the release candidate that's being added, a lot of it is still, or several things are representing things that exist in netx data that didn't exist in gtfs data which is like those groups of stations yeah. uh, gtfs just has stations and stops and in netx you can have layers going all the way up to like something representing a whole town and then uh transfers and interchanges so there's like more specialized kinds of transfers that are a little different than even in gtfs so several of these things are netx features several of them are mapping uh, old API parameters into a new router and the remaining stuff, the itinerary filter and the multi-criteria search, that's about result quality, right? Uh, yeah, uh, 
the itinerary of the Ergel, uh, it's, we talked a little bit about this on the, um, with the open day. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically when uh, a rapper and especially with our military search enables you to uh, get a lot of results back. It can be thousands of results, not just like 10. So uh, you need to figure out which results you want to present to the user. Yeah. Uh, so that's that. And um, I guess these two tasks are can be done in parallel, yeah, probably. Uh, so. And then true multi criteria search is implemented in the wrapper, but not in Autopy 2. So you need to do some work to allow uh, allow for multi criteria search. So what what's what's available in the beta is really a rate based um, criteria together. Um, with uh, uh, arrival time and uh, transfers. Those are the three criteria that's uh, in of in the data. So I think that summarizes the upcoming development between now when we can start testing and when we're going to stop adding features. I guess we wanted to aim for a question and answer kind of format mostly. We got a few questions already from um, from several people, we got some by email and uh, Slack before, and we just got one from the chat. So maybe we should move over to answering sure. people's questions. Uh, I guess we could take the one that just came by chat first, which was the state of the OTP2 documentation. Um, maybe we'll stop this and just go over here. So we could. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of questions here. And then we had, we shouldn't forget the question we got from UL from um, Slack. And we yeah. got some from Thomas at Trivium also. We can just start with the Slack and then. Uh, sure. Because that's only one session and then it's out to the way and we can continue here. Yeah. Um, so I, the question was uh, are we going to support multi language on street data and Fancy data in what we do. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the short answer is uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in NetX, NetX has support for multiple languages. Uh, I'm sure we would like to support that in the internal model of what we soon. Uh, we want support reading the chan the, the translation so this translation txt and gpfs um, so that's up for someone to actually grab and do a sandbox implementation if they want to have that uh, and the reason i say sandbox is that this is not a part of the finalized gpf spec yeah so um, it should live in a sandbox until it's finalized. Uh, I would so, so about it being in Syrian in the internal model, or sorry, in GTFS RT. There's one place I know of in GTFS RT where you actually have translated strings. So in real time data, you can get alerts that have multiple languages. Okay. That's that exists in the input data that exists internally and there's a way for that to go out in the api so someone makes a request and they say i prefer this language and they should get alerts that match that so there's one place where there's an idea of how this could work and so it could be extended to other strings and other places but we don't have a plan to implement that part beyond possibly where it exists in the real-time data but there's a way that it could be done with a sandbox module. And then to the direct question we had about whether we're supporting transfer uh, translations TXT is not part of the specification yet. So part of getting it into the specification is making an implementation. So I think realistically, we're talking about something that's going to take several months. It could happen over the course of the year if somebody wants to do the implementation in order to get it into the spec. But it's kind of like a... Um, 
there, there's a cycle that needs to happen where we look at the specification, implement it, show that it's possible, and then it gets into the spec and then it gets finalized. So it, it can be done, but it's going to be a process. That, um, yeah. So that may be the most important thing is that it will be available on the GraphQL APIs mm -hmm. to support multi language and also the internal module. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not sure when. I can't say that. Okay. Uh, should we go to this? So, let, when I when I say shall, uh, I'm talking from like what I. All of this is subject to discussion in the uh, PLC and on that. So when I say I or we or I'm talking about what we want to do at and to, mm -hmm. it's not uh, anything else that this is going to happen or not. This is our. Uh, what we want to do, and then of course it's up for discussion. Yeah, there's a certain out of all the development effort that's being put in, there are you know, on on the core OTP there are at least the two of you who are working on this full time. So a significant chunk of the work on OTP two that we both of you and a lot of the time that I would put into it is through Intuit. So the features are going to be prioritized based on what is needed by Intuit. So that's why there's a lot of NetTech stuff on there because it's needed by Intuit or by organizations that Intuit works with in Europe that are trying to move toward NetTech. So yeah, a lot of this stuff is, it's not that we don't want it to be done. If somebody did it as well, especially in the sandbox future, we would look to integrate some of these features, but we have to be aware of what Intuit needs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a question about the uh, state of the documentation. Um, OTP2 documentation. We try to keep documentation up to date when we do pull requests. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have also a cleanup task um, at the end to actually go over and clean up the documentation, but maybe that should be prioritized with. Uh, Someone wants to test out this because we really want other people to test it and get feedback. Uh, there's all kinds of documentation too, right? There's yeah. documentation on the code, Java doc kind of stuff. There's documentation about setting it up and running it. There's documentation about what the API looks like. Um, the Java doc, we are adding all the time whenever we work on something. So we're trying to increase the amount of the code that has a lot of comments in it. So that's definitely improving over time. The usage documentation, the original idea was that it shouldn't change. So when we were doing, when we were working on OTP2, we were trying to improve the efficiency and you know add some input formats and so on, but not really change how it looked from the outside when you're deploying it or setting it up to make that transition easy. And so that's why we're still, we still have the uh, same API that was on 1.0 and some of the options when you started up are similar. But um, up until now, we didn't change much. In the last couple of days, we have simplified the options for starting up OTP. So we're starting to get to a point where how you would build a graph and how you would start up the server is changing. But if anything, it's getting easier to do because it's a bit, there's less of these uh, lots of subdirectories that have to be in a certain structure and stuff. So I think we're just getting to a point where we need to update the documentation to show how to do that. And there's some of this where there wasn't good enough documentation before anyway. So I think after a pull request that we have sitting there right now, that's going to change some of those configuration options. I will probably make a, uh, a sort of intermediate tutorial that shows how to start up an OTP2 server as soon as those uh, command line options are stabilized, which is probably within, uh, or stable enough to make use of it within a day or two from now. So I'll keep that in mind that you probably really need some uh, mid-level tutorial, one page, how to start up OTP2. It's probably important to, to note that the documentation that is out there on the web is documentation for OTP1, and that you actually have to check out OTP2 read OTP2 documentation. Yeah. So, so the, maybe we can look into uh, publishing OTP2 documentation in parallel. That's 
The documentation is on oh, sure. read the docs, and you can set up more than one build. Uh, you can see different versions. So if you go to read the docs, where you see the OTP documentation, it's showing the master branch right now. Then there's a 1.x dev and a 2.x dev branch, which are going to start diverging probably. So uh, it can build different versions of the documentation for that. And you will look in, um, I think it's maybe lower right corner, somewhere in the corner, you can pick which version of the documentation you're looking at on, uh, on, on read the docs. So the, the main project documentation. And be sure to go to the one for 2.x if you want to see the, any tutorials that are there for how to run 2.x. Well, I, um, yeah, about uh, there's a question from Ian about uh, what the three criteria uh, they were going to support in the multi criteria routing. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I wasn't clear. Um, because uh, we have just uh, wrapper is always using the number of transfers and uh, the time in addition to some other criteria. Those are the three criteria uh, we have now. Mm -hmm. And then we want to dynamically add all the criteria. So which other criteria we want to support? Uh, uh, I don't know yet. But my understanding is that you have a bunch of different things that can happen during the trip that will chain that, that are, you have a bunch of various criteria, but for efficiency reasons, you're probably only going to have three, which would be time transfers and generalized cost. Yeah, that's the base. Uh, yeah. So okay. the generalized cost is like a combination of all the other criteria. Anything that you could put a cost on during the whole trip would all be sort of rolled into a single Yes, that's awesome. similar to what you have in OTP one now. It's similar to what you have yeah. in OTP one. That's how OTP one worked, was supposed to work, and did work for a while. Is a multi-criteria, Pareto optimal routing kind of system, where you had time and yeah. transfers and generalized cost, can... but it was too slow, so it's only optimizing on generalized cost now, yeah. which is not quite correct. So mm -hmm. it's but, like, yeah. but I think for smaller operations, there it's meaningful to actually have more than uh, just one. Wait criteria, and mm. uh, uh, we will try out with all the criteria. So we uh, mm. test that. So we we'll certainly implement um, the possibility to configure all the criteria. So my sense so, is that okay. so, so you can maybe like have walking as its own criteria, and then have a general cost in addition to walking, for example. You have two extra. Uh, two criteria in addition to transcripts and, mm -hmm. and time. So every time you add more criteria, it produces more and more and more possible results. The, the more different criteria you have, the more different routes there can be that are also good in a different way. So yeah. that's what the filtering is about too, right? Uh, yeah. You're producing more and more, and then you need to break that down to a shorter list of viable trips. So you've got more... Um, variables during the routing and then you can have some things that you configure after the routing on how to score and sort those new trips that come back. Yeah. Uh, we shouldn't forget to pull up Thomas's email at some point or he can actually he could also we could also take calls from people who just want to turn on their mic or camera and, and talk to. Maybe we could answer one more uh, this one more question from the chat that's already here, and then start taking some audio. Yeah, maybe, or maybe Thomas can post his questions. I think Thomas is here. Yeah. I think it would also be nice to have some other people talking too. So yeah. if uh, if anyone wants to switch on the microphone and ask a question, we can do that too. Yeah. Should we ask this one first? Maybe we can I'll... give take care of the uh, the one in the chat and then move on to audio questions. So this was about the OTP2 testing with Dutch Transit Network. Uh, okay, glad you're getting good results. Uh, some information, some stuff is not working anymore. Yeah, there's there will be quite a few things that don't work. So uh, what you probably will get from trying out OTP2 is much faster response times, maybe better variety of results. 
uh, ability to use NetX data, but some features will stop working. So that's expected at this point. We're still adding stuff back in. But what specifically you mentioned was pricing and GBFS. Um, the pricing is added after the fact. So the way it works in OTP is it does the search and then it goes back and figures out the price for, for the trips and adds it on after it has already found them. So it should be possible to add that kind of pricing back. As it is just, um, you do the search, you prepare I, the responses. I it was, uh, maybe working, but I'm not sure. Okay. I, I haven't looked, I actually haven't looked at that on a, uh, OTP2 instance, but it should be very straightforward to add that back if for some reason it's not working. If it is coming from NetX, I'm not sure if that's going to work. But with GTFS data, it should work just like it did before. Of course, it's, it is not necessarily a good thing that you don't know what the price is while you're, um, that you don't know what the price is while you're doing the search. But due to the way prices are, it's, it's harder to do that on the fly. It's not something you'll be able to do right now. The pricing in NetX is, uh, yeah, very complex. So, uh, you're not going to support that in NetP2. Uh, you do the pricing side of NetP. Uh, in a, in a separate model. Yeah. So, that sometime in the far future, you might integrate with that model, module somehow. Uh, you can do that in the filtering process. So, you decorate your, like, say, uh, um, you're decorating 20 itineraries and then you filter on the price after that. So, the, when you say we, that's at Entour. Yeah. Your, uh, the, so. But the, the, if, if you do that, we will make the, make the code available somehow and discuss yeah. if, if there are other people interested in the same code, then you can pull request it up in the sandbox or something like that because this, this is in the blue. So to clarify the situation, Entour's main mission is to unify ticketing for Norway. So they provide a ticketing system. And all of this ticketing and pricing stuff is done on top of the trip planner, right? So it's, it's, a, it's actually a separate module that is very, uh, it's like it's sophisticated module in its own right that is, uh, probably very customized for the Norwegian case. Uh, so it, it, is that going to be open source? Some, some, some parts of it will be open source. It could be adapted, but. Unlike the, G the GTFS we've always done inside OTP, the NetX stuff actually has to happen outside OTP for pricing at this point. So yeah. I have a question about um, pricing. Y'all can hear me, right? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um, so uh, this uh, uh, doing pricing after the fact, as you've described in the you know uh, uh, midterm, say the next uh, two to three years, um, does that preclude effectively doing multi-criteria, uh, uh, you know, routing uh, uh, calculation with price as one of the criteria? Um, or could that be done? It would just sort of need to be done as a separate module, primarily outside of the core of OTP. If anything, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, I guess you could do that as um, a separate criteria, uh, but it depends on what kind of pricing structure that you have. Mm -hmm. If you have several complex pricing structures, then that, that can be difficult. And then you need to put it on afterwards. But if you yourself are able to add like some kind of simple pricing structure, then there's no problem adding that as a se separate criteria. Yeah. And that's, that's the way we actually are thinking or implementing this. We will emulate emulate what's, what's uh, the pricing consists of and then use that as a criteria to filter on. Mm -hmm. So for example, the operator uh, might be important for the pricing and we can use, um, we can select different itineraries for, from different operators if they are almost the same. So in that way, maybe we cannot always guarantee that we will find the lowest price but we will increase the chances as long as the criteria we are optimizing on are aligned closely with the pricing criteria then we can uh, maximize our chances of finding 
uh, the proofs that we want and uh, the lowest price. The, the way I look at it is in, in the general case, you cannot use the price as one of the criteria because prices are across all the systems and the transit systems in the world. The prices are not additive. As you move through your trip, you can actually take an action that makes the price go down. You can transfer to something that where you basically you can't be sure that the price only goes up, which is something that is necessary for the routing to work. So for all the trips where the price does only go up as you move from one thing to another, you can calculate the price. So for all those, it will work. And there'll just be some cases where it doesn't work out. So as long as you accept that compromise, it can be moved into OTP. Uh, inside of the routing part. If you do it outside of OTP in another module, it can't really be one of the criteria. That It has to be able to calculate the price as it's searching. You know, it looks at one bus, uh, progressing down the line on one bus, transferring to another bus at every step of the way. It needs to know roughly what the price is while it's searching through all those options. So um, that's, yeah, if, if we can accept that it won't be exactly right in every case, that can be done inside. It, can't really be added on as an after the fact. Um, and the, both the GTFS thing we're describing where it's coming out of OTP and the NetX system where another module is adding it on, you know, out in a whole ecosystem of pricing and ticketing modules. Uh, in both cases, they're being added at the end. So the, the system now is to try to get a big variety of trips based on all the other criteria that probably reflect some that are more expensive and less expensive, then tag all of the prices onto them and then sort them. But uh, clearly it would be better to estimate the price inside. Before. But that's also in a more different situation where you have all of the operators in all of Norway and all of them can have different pricing structures. Yeah. And you can combine them in a lot of ways. If you're doing this for just one operator in one city, then maybe yeah. you can calculate it on the fly because you don't need to have all of this combination and just it depends on the ticketing system of that one operator. Yeah. If, I would say if there's somebody who wants to have that functionality, it's something that is a, it's a self-contained feature that could certainly be added. Uh, it would be interesting to see how necessary it is. It's possible that tagging the prices on at the end gives you a pretty good variety already. But if it doesn't, doesn't give you what you need, uh, it is something that could be done as, a, as an add-on. Uh, to finish uh, with the chat question, there's also GBFS was mentioned. Uh, all of those modules are still there, so there should be no problem loading GTFS and reflecting that in the street network. I think the problem you're running into is that we're using the street network search, the same old OTP one street network search to get from your starting point to transit and to get from transit to your destination. So all of the old nodes that existed should still be usable there with, with a relatively little adaptation. The problem is just for the time being, the focus has been on replacing that transit router. So when we do the searches to get to and from transit, it's not really using all of the options. It's it's taking a few of the options, like the walking speed or whatever, and, and popping it in there and doing those searches, but it's not replicating all of the options that you're passing in, and that includes the modes. Mm -hmm. So um, we were just working on this the other day. So uh, right now, it's actually always searching by walking to get to and from transit, no matter what you set the mode to. But in theory, if we copied all those modes over properly, it would use the other modes to get to and from transit. It's just the there are cases that haven't been covered because up until now that's just been used to kind of test the core yeah, transit work. It's just not been the focus. Yeah. Uh, until we have finished the transit part, then that's like the next step. To, yeah. So is that one of the things that between now and the release candidate, we would look at allowing, say, a bicycle or bike share modes to happen to and from transit? Or is that a post release thing? I think uh, from the release candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, the release candidate is just before we uh, 
It'll be with, yeah, no features are going to be added after that until so it's 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 that before. Right. Yeah, so allowing all the other the existing street modes would be sometime in the first quarter of 2020, which I will instate all of that, right? Right. Sometimes, it, it, I'm guessing, just from looking at our own timeline and the fact that we don't add any features after we get to the release candidate, we're going to be trying to add back all the non-walking modes, ability to use the non-walking yeah, yeah. modes sometime in the first quarter of 2020. Yeah, yeah, I think possible. so. And then uh, then we'll add it in the same state that we were in MPP1. And of course, after that, uh, we will make that in a more general way. Is it okay. reasonable? Yeah, but I, I think some of these features we will add much sooner than that. Yeah. Well, because yeah. now we can now we can actually start testing it and getting feedback. And some of the things will be really fast and easy to fix, and we'll just fix them uh, instead of postponing. Smaller things will fix fast. I, I was actually yeah, I was actually going to ask: Is it reasonable? Based on we were already working on this a couple of days ago. Thinking through how to do it, is it reasonable to say we can re-enable those other modes? So you could add a bicycle or something. It will search, get those paths and travel times, feed them into the transit router, and it will work. Like we could get it to function, but some mode combinations might be flaky and not work right. But we could reinstate it and see how it works. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, at least like uh, back and ride and park and ride and all yeah. those. Uh, that should be reasonable. Okay. Yeah, so we can we can aim to yeah make it yeah. handle those modes. Uh, it might not work a hundred percent, but we'll get it back in there soon. Uh, Robert has a great follow up question in mm -hmm. the uh, chat on pricing. How how would one add such a, a criteria or other criteria into the the multi criteria uh, calculations? Yeah. So let's say the uh, the pricing is a function of Data that is already in OTP, then it's uh, then it's uh, we haven't decided designed this yet, but then it will be like uh, writing the small piece of code that actually performs that calculation and uh, enable that as a criteria and uh, compare the server to use it. If the criteria is not in the internal model, then or the the, the, the pieces some some data is needed from the outside, then you also have to add uh, uh, some way of actually getting into the to, <laughs> into memory so you can use it. Yeah, the pricing data if it's coming from GTFS, we are loading it and it's available inside of the inside of our internal data model. The router does not see it yet. So part of the job of getting of getting this to work would be basically whenever you make a sandbox module, if it extends something that hasn't been extended before, part of the job is making the extension points. So we would need a way for that information to be visible to the router at all. That's part of the job. But if I were to summarize how it would work, while you're doing the routing, you're moving, you're, you're making one movement at a time, one step at a time from one stop to the next to the next and seeing how those paths compare to each other. And you, as you make, basically every time you get on or off a new vehicle in that process, you need to look up what it costs and add it into, uh, add it into a state variable all along the process. It's, uh, it may be that the interfacing, the, the adding the interfaces that allow the routing algorithm to even see the price information, it may be a more complicated part of the task. Yeah. And uh, it's very important here that any external calls during the routing search is not possible due to performance unless you have a very, very small gap. It's going to be too slow. Uh, yeah, that's the cost calculation. Yeah. Yeah, the transfer calculation and uh, traversing the trips uh, pretty much has to be, most of the data has to be pre-calculated to, to, to work. Yeah. yeah. So how many times does this calculation have to happen? Is it in the big network, it's in the hundreds and thousands of times 
that's what you said. So we are searching like uh, from in in Oslo city from um, a place that is just a couple of kilometers apart. It's millions. Yeah. yeah. But that's why you're talking about three computing centers. You need to look at all the prices, all the transfers that can happen, make a bunch of tables. And then you do need to do it millions of times, but it has to be millions of lookups of all of your computer information, how much it costs. Yeah, or very, very, very simple, yeah, simple uh, uh, addition. Yeah, yeah. So, like a different thing. Yeah. yeah. So, and this, uh, so looking at a time, we've been on for pretty close to 50 minutes. Uh, I would like to take some more questions. So we've been getting some technical implementation stuff. I imagine there are questions about deployment and other things, but I know, um, Thomas, did you have some other questions also? You mentioned a few to us before. Yeah, and you all have been great and actually largely answered um, many of my questions. One thing just to to confirm that everyone understands sort of what people can do now to go and use OTP2. Um, what I heard you say earlier was that broadly speaking, um, you should be able to use the same OTP build and deploy process that you were using yesterday, but reference the 2.x branch as your commit as opposed to the master branch. Um, that broadly speaking, that that should work. Is that correct? Yeah, almost. Yeah, there's some nuances. But first, I remember you asked us, um, is there going to be a jar file that you can just grab? We're pretty much continuously right. changing this. It, uh, certain actions, certain kind of merges and builds may produce jar artifacts, but probably the best thing to do is to, to build it from the dev 2.x branch. So currently, there's a dev 1.x and a dev 2.x branch. We usually don't merge anything into Dev 2.x unless it builds and all the tests pass. So it's probably it's reasonable to try to work with that Dev 2.x branch, and you should just need to do a Maven build to uh, produce the jar file that you need to run. There's already a description of doing that stage uh, in, the, in the documentation, and that doesn't change much, if at all. Um, if we do any kind, if we do a release candidate or a beta release, we'll make a jar of that and tell everybody where they can download it. Uh, but Great. if you want to use the newest stuff, so let's say that yeah, we'll do one. We'll do at least two release jars so for the uh, beta and RC, and then otherwise, if you want to try out the new stuff, use the two point X and do a maven build. Uh, it, the original intent was to keep everything almost exactly the same. We have started revising the command a little bit but um let's say the overall approach is the same you make a directory you put your gtfs feed and your osm data or if you're using uh netx data you put your netx zip file and your osm data into a directory and you point otp at that directory and say build and it and it builds it uh, and you have another command to load or run the server and um, like I said, I will make a tutorial on those new commands, which should actually be easier to do with than the old ones uh, in the 2.x documentation uh, within the next couple of days. Great. So, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, it, another question, um, it, it, you know, for someone who maybe is is planning to uh, uh, hire developers for um, development on OTP, basically, has there it, it, in, in OTP2, is there any substantial change to the resume or CV of a good candidate for open trip planner development as you, as you see it? Hmm. There's a lot of continuity between OTP1 and OTP2. I mean, the highest level, when you, it's still all in Java. It's still all using a lot of the same libraries for geospatial computations, uh, a lot of the same design patterns. We're trying to be, we're trying to talk more about, previously we were, we were all applying some, some design concepts, architectural concepts without really agreeing on what we all thought was the best way. So we're, we're actually working on guidelines also, uh, all kind of coming, coming together in agreement on kind of how 
what our architectural principles are and what our standards are for coding. So we'll be adding those to the documentation to this developer's guide. We've already got some stuff to add on there. So keep an eye on the developer's guide section and keep an eye on uh, like the tutorials also. But for this question, the, the developer's guide section might give you some hints about like what the overall philosophy is um, in libraries we're, we're using, the approach that we're using. I'll probably be mentioning that. But overall, it's not too different than what we were doing before. Certainly, the, the transit routing is a vector algorithm now, which is quite different than uh, but we're still using the A star routing also. So yeah, it's stuff that probably anybody with an interest in uh, operations research or um, that probably would require the same kind of background and interest in picking up research papers and getting up to speed on that, but it hasn't changed too much. Same world, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, Robert just... has a follow-up on the chat about oh. your answer to his question earlier. Okay. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, he's, didn't he say, did he clarify something? Oh, summarize. Uh, data needs to be added to the graph if it isn't there already. Oh, for the pricing. Is this, this is about the uh, oh. prices, right? Okay. Data needs to be added to the graph if it isn't there already. Yeah, so um, previously, here's an architectural kind of thing that we've been ironing out recently. Pref previously, we re referred to everything as the graph was like the master object that had everything in it and we're kind of trying to break that up so um, we will have we're trying to have a transit data model that has all of the transit data you loaded from gtfs or mfx that is not really the graph that's like the transit data and the graph is made from the transit data and the graph is the writable thing and so you'd need to add it to the transit data model and make sure that got saved along with the graph uh, which would be that not really. Uh, yeah, probably not. Okay. It has to at least the function can actually go out, so the function that we could have calculated there. So, sure. You know. I guess depending on how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but of course, there's a lot of different ways to do everything. But so maybe it's not going into that model, but you need to get the data in there from your source yeah. data. It might be stored alongside, but yeah, it needs to get in there and get saved one way or the other, the way that you do the graph. You might even pre-compute a bunch of stuff from the input data and only save those tables, for example. But you have to get it in there and save it, for sure. And then uh, extra data in the graph needs to be passed to the new router, right? So the new router is also, we've been trying to break things into components where you have a package that does one thing, like the, the new router or this transit model or whatever, and those packages have no dependencies, not in the sense of the imported jar files, or the dependencies like they don't use classes from any other package. So we've been trying to nice, you know, cleanly separate things into modules. And the router talks to the whole rest of the world via an interface that's very simple. It just says, you know, hand me one time at one stop on my route or something. So that would need to be extended yeah, to allow some, you to... Some of the criteria is just a number to the router. It needs to know if it should use a less than or equals or different than comparison uh, because you can use in minions as a mm -hmm. criteria. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the router doesn't really... You only have to tell the router how many criteria you are using. So item two about, yeah, you need to get the extra data that you have imported and processed into the router. And what that implies is taking a package of code that exists and somehow extending the interface of that. So it has a way to read yeah. um, arbitrary numbers that we can use as a, uh, as a new criterion model as well. Yeah. Yes, Um, the timeline for after the two hundred years. Yeah, we need to share the screen to show that. Should warn that the timeline for after two point zero release is all in gray because it's much less certain what is in there. Uh, let's see the bottom. You have to. Oh, I missed the wrong one. I think it was the wrong one. This one, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. There. Mm -hmm. So that's good. 
So uh, the whole post 2.0 section is intentionally a bit gray, but I guess we can describe what's there and why it's there. Yeah, so uh, flexible transport version one uh, is more or less fully fit. One has now very limited support for flexible transport. Uh, we will re-implement that uh, with some additions. That's version one of this, I guess. Uh, that is uh, very high up on the roadmap for Intuir. So uh, they will probably start working on this uh, before the work be to release. So it might be available um, in parallel to work be So that's important to mention. The Once we have the feature freeze and we're only doing bug fixes on OTP 2.x branch, uh, the, the you know in that release candidate period, of course, Entour is going to go on providing trip plans and tickets to everyone in Norway and building stuff that is needed for doing that, and that might include some flexible transport work, but that could be over on the fork of OTP. And prob it, it, it's uh, the reason it shows up after two point is because it probably won't get packaged up into a pull request and really nicely integrate into what everyone sees as the dev 2 point branch until after it too, right? But it's yeah. possible it will be developing in the meantime other people will be working on it. Yeah, uh, it's depending on who will work on this, there are some other uh, there are, are some interests in, around that, so it might be more than just when you're developing it. So uh, then it find a uh, way to share it. Floating services. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, any vehicle that might be uh, floating around in a city. Uh, so not boats. But <laughs> not boats. Not boats, but uh, <laughs> bikes that do not have docks, like, right? Yeah, but I guess boats. That's, we already have boats. <laughs> that's when you have like the location of an individual vehicle on a map. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to just like a service area or something like that. So one example is the scooters mm -hmm. that you have actually have the position of individual scooters on a map and you maybe want to ride someone to an individual scooter. So it's often personal mobility things like bicycles and scooters that don't have docks. That's yeah. That kind of system. Yeah. 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 So that's also something that people have been working on OTP one, and due to the changes in the routing system, we expect certain things have to be re-implemented. But you want to make that possible. Yeah, we will. Uh, it's not. Uh, um, yeah, it's hard for, hard for me to see how high up on the priority list is. So um, flexible transport is definitely yeah needed for Norway, and floating services are like. Something that you would be nice to have, but we don't know how that's going to be prioritized. I, mean, I can say that all of this that has to be the, uh, has to do with the street routing is going to be much easier to implement. And when we do the flexible transport, we will also more or less uh, uh, pave the road for uh, doing um, some of the work on street routing. Very much. much it's been very complicated right now, and it's going to be much easier. It's going to be much more straightforward than OTP one. Yeah. And so, those of us who have been looking forward to working on OTP two, this is one of the reasons that in OTP one, the whole search is going through the street network, and then through the transit network, and then back through the street network, all in one giant search, and which back and then goes backwards and does the same thing mm -hmm. in multiple directions. So. It makes it much more difficult to break things into small units and solve small problems one at a time because you think you've solved the part where you're dealing with the floating bike, but then you get into transit and somehow the fact that you're on this floating bike starts interfering with the fact that you're on transit and it, it gets to be quite a mess. Uh, and there's all kinds of heuristic code and everything that was interfering with this. So it gets a lot easier now because you have a transit router and a street router in it. It does one street route, it routes on the street, then it looks at the transit, then it looks at the street again, and each thing is happening as a separate stage. So you can deal with these things in a more self-contained way. So maybe it's going to be 
say re-implementing this within the OTP2 context is probably easier than, like it's gonna be a more uh, straightforward process than getting it to work fully in OTP1. Mm -hmm. When it's faster street routing, uh, yes, it's, uh, you already know that the street routing is uh, slow and it's uh, slow because of the uh, transit uh, reduced because it was optimized for transit. Now that mm -hmm. when that is taken out, we can optimize it with, for cars and walking and bicycling. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes that faster. Yeah, but because and uh, this is like an A star search and you know the algorithms to make street routing lightning faster and graph of yeah. any size. So it doesn't matter to implement in that. Um if they have that implemented, it should make all of this flexible and part and wide and all of these options to be work much better uh, when you yeah, uh, when you have a faster street router. Yeah, then that uh, the time the street routing takes shouldn't take shouldn't be really done as well. Though. For basic walking and biking, it's not a huge deal right now, right? Because the street routing is limited. Unlike before, when we were searching all the way through the whole network, it's like searching out to a certain distance, finding transit stops, and it stops. So it's it's an it's increment in the in distance. But uh, in the future, we may want to do it over long distances, mm -hmm. and then sure in the add car. Yeah, then this becomes a neutral. But right now we have such a limited distance that is, it is lightning fast, uh, anyway. So once you get up to doing, uh, car park and ride searches, which probably is fairly straightforward to turn on. If we asked it now to do a park and ride search, it would at least find transit stations and you could then proceed to a transit search. It's conceptually, there's not a problem with that, but the radius is bigger. And then suddenly that street search becomes almost all of the time. That you spend on the search, right? Yeah. So then we need to start optimizing the street. Especially because it's just in Norway, you have a long distance uh, yeah. in places. And, uh, yeah. And the last point here is access mode transitions. Uh, yeah, we, we are just briefly thinking about this and discussing it. Uh, um, but we want to make it be more flexible when it comes to actually defining what is a legal sequence of changing modes so we can like allow walking, car, biking, uh, transit, biking, and walking, for example. Um, so uh, making this a table instead of actually an um, implementation on the graph is what we you just can list what kind of transitions you would allow. Yeah, and uh, maybe in the configuration, when yeah. you start up the server, the, um, out, out of all the different yeah. modes, there's so many combinations of what you could do before yeah. and after that you could so set up. Yeah, yeah, so we set up and define what kind of mode, what you define what kind of mode the uh, transitions you allow. Right now, a lot of this is hard coded in and it's Kind of difficult to know from the mode parameters what kind of mode combinations uh, are allowed. But we want to generalize this and make it explicit what kind of combinations uh, you are allowed to use. So I guess we've been going for about an hour now. Uh, we originally planned for an hour, right? But if anybody has any uh, pressing questions on the line, that would uh, give me a couple more questions. Have two more comments. Oh, but, uh... Okay. And collaborating on some of these topics. Open Triple R developers lists and GitHub are definitely what we're using the most often. Uh, I'm wondering um, on Sven's last question, maybe, um, you, you know, when. Uh, sense I'm getting here is sort of, you know, wanting to, wanting to help, but not being quite sure of, of where to start. And I'm wondering if it would be possible, um, maybe for you all to eat, like put a tag on certain GitHub issues, um, mm -hmm. that could draw attention to community members of just like, Hey, this is a, this is a great place to start your investigation, or we could use a little help here. Okay. 
That's the best way. I think, yeah, one thing that comes up often is every time we talk about adding, even some when we talk about adding something ourselves, we're frequently talking about adding it to the sandbox features, which are things that are, uh, which are things that are um, shut off by default, basically don't cause any uh, any side effects on the rest of the system when they're switched off. Yeah. And that way we can, if we follow these guidelines, we can integrate them quickly and start trying them out without needing to worry too much about the review process. So there's certain stuff like that. Translations, for example, if, so if there was an issue created for that, everyone agreed that it was something that needed to get done, it could always be done as a sandbox feature. So you go through a minimal amount of back and forth, just a little bit of discussion on an issue in GitHub to ensure that there was agreement that such a thing made sense and that uh, everyone uh, had a chance to kind of suggest how we might want to implement it. And then somebody could just run with it as a sandbox feature and there would be no barrier to managing that as long as it was uh, structured properly. Yeah, and also if uh, I think uh, get in touch is also uh, a good way to actually talk to us and we can find something that's in my email or Slack. Or, yeah. Yeah, email or Slack. Uh, because I think, well, we're using a Slack channel, but that's internal to, or semi-internal. It's internet. actually open. Uh, oh, okay. It's mm -hmm. anyone who wants to join the Slack channel, oh, okay. channel can do that. So that's an, that's uh, an option. Yeah, that Slack channel was meant for people interested in the OP2 development and, and uh, developers in primarily, but yeah. Okay, so get in touch via Slack or creating or commenting on issues on GitHub or the developers list. That's yeah. three primary ways. And then, um, I guess we could also so try to get some adoption of this you know, get people start thing. Just, uh, well, certainly out of the stuff that we already have or things that we mentioned, we could we get a pretty good idea of what we are going to have time to work on or what we're going to be prioritizing and come up with other stuff as we can mark things yeah, as yeah. we are not really planning on doing this soon. Sure. So anyway, that cues people on what they could pick up and work on. Mm. Okay. So as far as things we, we need to do after this, I guess that's one of them. Uh, Mark some issues as things other people want to pick up. I need to update the um, some kind of intermediate tutorial for OTP2 in the code guidelines. Uh, anything? Does anyone else have any questions uh, by audio? If you just want to jump on, or yeah, if not, we could uh, wrap up. Will there be uh, documentation on how to implement a sandbox feature? Uh, yeah, that's already out there. Uh, it's in a markdown file in the repo. Does that appear in the documentation that's published on Redux? Uh I'm trying to think if it's uh, it's probably not added on uh, one point. Sorry. Or you probably have if if you look at the dev to point x branch in GitHub, uh, you can read the documentation there. Okay. All the links is working on the markdown. Yeah. Is, is it is it in? I know it's only in two point. It may only be in two point x, but is it in a place where it will actually be part of the built markdown documentation? Well, I'm just go over and. So I am an OpenShift planner. Um, I'll just select the uh, yeah, inner series. Yeah. Oh, okay. it's not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I just selected uh, the Dev2 branch here. Then uh, I can just go into the doc. 
tax folder and uh, sandbox. Uh, the sandbox documentation is on the front page. Right? Okay. Sandbox so, extension? Yeah. So this is the documentation on the sandbox, and this uh, is the contract. It says uh, something about the responsibilities of the community and what kind of responsibility you have as a committer of a sandbox and what to expect from the reviewers. Um, uh, there are a couple of exam examples that you can look at to get started. And then there is that sandbox uh, folder, which is the documentation that was added with each sandbox. Yes, because there has so to be can, a minimum. We can look at one of the examples here. Um, I'm able to see the update. There is recently added. Ah, uh, yeah, the documentation there is very poor. Okay. Uh, so you should do at least here state who made this sandbox thing, so we can get in touch with you if there is something that we um. I want to ask about, and then uh, some of the, you can write any documentation you would like from here for the sandbox feature. Yeah, the key thing about the sandbox is that it's in its own package, doesn't uh, it has all of its stuff integrated in one package, and has clearly defined extension points uh, into the main code, and is switched off by default. There's more detail, but that's the basic idea. Yeah. So I guess uh we're beginning to the end. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, I'm glad we got uh over 30 people joining. So I'm happy to see there's a lot of interest in this. So 42 at one point. Oh really? <laughs> They're back down to only 30. So uh yeah. Looking forward to collaborating with uh, hopefully some of these 40 people on, on the code and seeing people deploying this. We're looking forward to feedback from people on the results and uh, let us know if there's anything unclear about how to get it up and running. And I'll try to update the documentation. Thanks. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.